Welcome to another episode of the Spiritual Leadership Podcast. I am really excited about our time together today, and I can't believe it's already September. I hope you've had a fantastic summer, and wherever you are in the weather and in the COVID situation, I pray God's grace is really resting upon you today. You know, it's hard to believe that we are just one month away from Spiritual Leadership Conference here at Lancaster Baptist Church, October the 3rd through the 6th, and our theme is declare the gospel. And really, that's where we must begin. That's where the early church began. And I don't know about you, but I feel as though beginning again is appropriate as we come out of COVID, and there's no better beginning point than preaching the gospel. So if you have a heart to see God work in his way through his gospel, join with us right here in Lancaster, California, and you'll enjoy great evening services, wonderful music, 40 workshops, and then high tables set up in the afternoons for fellowship with all of our speakers. It's just going to be a great time, and I hope to meet many of you at this year's Spiritual Leadership Conference. We already have hundreds of churches registered. If you've not registered, let me encourage you to go to LancasterBaptist.org and join with us. And finally, thanks for all the good input from last month's podcast. If you enjoy your time with us today, be sure to like us on social media or tell a friend. We always appreciate uh, those generous referrals and the encouragement along the way as well. Well, today we're going to be touching on a great subject, uh, something that means a lot to me, and that is the spiritual connectivity between Christian leaders. Uh, what are some of the connecting points that draw us together and keep us together uh, as we serve the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, and my guest today is my dear friend, Dr. R.B. Ouellette. And uh, the Lord drew us together many years ago, and uh, we've had the privilege of spending a lot of time over the years uh, in uh, churches and on airplanes and out soul winning and on mission fields, and I cherish those moments. I love serving the Lord with uh, God's men uh, doing God's work in God's way. And uh, Dr. Willett, of course, you'll be here with us uh, in a few weeks for the Spiritual Leadership Conference. We're excited about that. And a lot of times as I travel... Uh, people will ask me about your ministry, or if we preach together, I'll tell them about your ministry. Uh, sometimes they might think they know you from one tweet <laughs> or maybe from one sermon. Uh, but having really had the opportunity to spend time with you, I cherish uh, the influence you've had in my life. I want you to know that. Uh, when I was uh, maybe in my late 20s, Dr. Curtis Hudson invited me to speak at a conference, and uh, I went there kind of like totally out of place, didn't know where I was, what I was doing. And you just intentionally decided to be a friend and a blessing to me, you and Dr. Bobby Robertson and others, and I'll never forget that. And uh, while others kind of took this wait and see about this church out in California, uh, you began to invest and encourage me, and I so appreciate that. But for those uh, who are with us today, uh, before we get into the content of this lesson, uh, who just really don't know you, I'd like you to maybe tell us a little bit of your testimony and how God saved you and put you in the ministry, and tell us about the years at the First Baptist Church of Bridgeport and what you're doing now. Well, my dad's testimony was in the last issue of the Baptist Voice, which is just a phenomenal story. So I was raised in a Christian home. My dad was a happy Christian. He loved serving God. He loved seeing what God did. He was solid. He was straight, but he just enjoyed the work of the Lord and one of the most positive and secure men that I ever knew. Uh, when I got out of college, I was an assistant pastor for two years, and then God made it clear I should go into a, a pastorate. He opened up the door of the First Baptist Church of Bridgeport. It was one of three places that had asked me to come pastor, and by far the worst situation. Uh, it had the worst building, it had the worst uh, salary, it had the worst city, but it had the most people. Amen. And I felt like there was some good could be done for the cause of Christ there. Saginaw, which Bridgeport is right next to as a border with, <clears throat> we have a Saginaw mailing address at our church. Saginaw has had the uh, highest per capita crime rate in America year after year, uh, eight years running the most violent city in America. Our buses have been shot, our bus workers have been shot at, uh, riots on our church property. And everybody said, don't go there. They said, all the good people have left that church. Nobody's ever built a church in Saginaw. You're not going to be the first one to do it. Everybody there is a Lutheran or a Catholic. Mm -hmm. But God said to go. 
And it was a wonderful ministry. We found out that Lutherans and Catholics become great Baptists after they get saved. Amen. And it was a marvelous experience to be able to minister to inner city people, suburban people, business people, and have all those kinds of people in our church because it's a small enough city, around 100,000 when I went there and less than 50,000 now, that you could reach out into the environs and still reach into the city itself. God bless the church. Our highest year of attendance was 1,800. And we have had, the, the thing that encourages me the most about our years of ministry there is they tell me we've had 200 or more young people that have gone out of our church and our Christian school into the work of the Lord. Amen. Well, it's definitely a church that has made an impact. And you were there how many years? 44 years. 44 years. And, you know, I remember uh, Dr. Lee Robertson writing the book 40 Plus uh, and just hearing about men uh, that had been at their church that long. And when I first met you, you might have been at your church, I don't know, less than 20. And now to hear you say 44 years, um, it's just amazing. And uh, it goes by so quickly. And yet, uh, thank God for His grace. And uh, of course, as you uh, now are not in the pastorate, tell us briefly the succession story uh, about the, and tell us about the new pastor and what you're now doing. Well, what God had showed me from the life of, of other people was that a lot of transitions are poor. And a lot of it's because the original pastor isn't ready spiritually, emotionally. Uh, he gets too attached to the identity of being the pastor of the church. So God helped us with that. We took about four years all together. We told people individually. By the time I announced it publicly, everybody knew. We voted two years before I was to leave. Okay. And he got a great vote. I mean, just a couple negative votes. I think he got more votes than I would have had if we had the vote, right, you know, for right. me to stay. And then uh, the the last year, we each preached half the time, but there was no particular order or pattern to it. I might preach three weeks in a row. He might preach five weeks in a row. I might preach one week and him too. And we never told anybody who's preaching when. I said, I don't want you to pick the old guy, make the young guy feel badly. I sure don't want you to pick the young guy, make the old guy feel badly. You've just come because it was church. And our people were so good, and he was so gracious to me. He's like a son to me, and I get to be the grandfather. I go back, I pat people on the head, I hug them. I don't have to change their diapers, solve their problems, <laughs> or clean up their messes. Well, that's probably a, a blessing, and I know you're staying busy. Your voice is uh, hoarse from all of the preaching, but I know you enjoy getting out and uh, you've been in so many meetings already and, and thank you for being here with us today. It's my honor. When I think about connectivity with pastors, um, there are several connection points that I want to cover in today's podcast, but I want to start with doctrine. Uh, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 4.16, take heed unto thyself, unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. And I've always said that doctrine is the glue that really holds us together. And we can talk later about uh, maybe uh, some uh, preferences or just different ways of doing methodologically, doing things differently. But uh, really, what would draw one pastor to another should be uh, commonality in the faith. And, and when I think about uh, doctrine, I think that's probably the strength of the movement we grew up in. Uh, Lots of podcasts have been done and will be done on the weaknesses of some of our, uh, you know, some of our past affiliations and so forth. But I would say that every group uh, has had its challenges that way. But the strength of any uh, fellowship of two men or more than two men or missions movement is going to be what they believe, because what they believe is going to determine how they behave. And uh, and I think with respect to doctrine, uh, we need to look for a common ground, whether it's supporting a missionary, whether it's having someone to preach for us and so forth. Maybe speak to that for a moment from the practical side of preaching and pastoring, uh, just the, the commonality of doctrine and why that's so important. Well, the Bible says, can two walk together except they be agreed? And I think we're at a good place in our independent Baptist churches now. When you were young, when I was young, it was where did you go to college and what mission board do you support and, and uh, who do you fellowship with, what fellowship did you join? And we decided somewhere along the way that maybe it doesn't matter where you went to college. If you believe the same things I believe, you have the same heart for the work of God, that we could do some things together in spite of different backgrounds. 
And I think that that's the way the Bible intends it. Uh, the Bible says in Christ there's neither Greek nor Jew, barbarian nor Scythian, bond nor free, uh, circumcision or uncircumcision. Christ is all in and all. And when we're united in the gospel and in the biblical mindset that says the word of God is our guide, it is our source of truth, and we're going to follow it, then we can work together with people that came from a lot of different places. And honestly, when you study the lives of men that we would respect, and even men that aren't in the independent Baptist ranks, you'll find in other areas, and I'm thinking right now of a few Southern Baptists, such as Jerry Vines, who, because of doctrine, uh, really fought for the inerrancy issue, and now uh, has shared with me uh, just the battle that he's having to take, and just standing at his latter ages, in his latter age, for truth uh, with respect to his position on whosoever will or with respect to his belief in soul winning and so forth. But the doctrine never leaves you. Uh, it's, it's there as a guidepost. And I think, you know, I've heard a lot of messages on renew, remove not the ancient landmarks, but that landmark of truth should never be moved. The Bible says buy the truth and sell it not. Right. And I, I think as far as the independent Baptist movement goes, that's why a lot of our men came out of the convention was before, in certain conventions, was before uh, the move toward inerrancy and some of the stand that some of these did take. There were questioning the miracles of the Bible, questioning the inerrancy of the Bible. So doctrine said, I've got to change up my fellowship and I've got to find like-minded men. And I love hearing Dr. Sisk and Dr. James Rushing and others have shared their testimony along those lines. So I think the first connection point really does need to be doctrine. I've had people come to our church who are patriots to share a testimony or who are people that fought for religious liberty or politicians that are pro-life, and I'll let them say a few things. But when it really comes to who's going to rightly divide the word and who am I going to uh, really uh, have close fellowship with, we, we need to have that common doctrine. I, I do think, Dr. Willette, that there can be a point, and I've seen this in some men's lives, and I say what I'm about to say because our theme today is connectivity, that they, they say, well, I'm doctrinally correct, and they become almost isolationist with it to the point that they almost become convinced no one else is doctrinally correct. And maybe speak to that for a moment. Well, there are some people who want you to be precisely like them in every exact area. And they'll make an issue of it. Sam Davison told me he preached for a man one time, and he asked about the verse, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And Brother Davison said, well, I think it talks about water baptism, but I think it's about the baptism of the Spirit as well. And the man said, well, you can't preach for me anymore. And Brother Davison said, well, I didn't ask to come this time. Yeah. But that was a fairly minor issue that he was going to make a major separation over. Right. I think you were telling me yesterday about one of the first times someone took a difference with you was over um, some relative of an Old Testament saint or something. Well, I had a man stand up in our church and argue with me because I believe the two and a half tribes were wrong to go on the east side of Jordan, that God wanted them on the west side. He believed it was okay. And that was his, he, he, he yelled, he, he quoted verses, and he walked out, and we sang. We always sing when people do something, like that because we can sing louder than they yell. Yeah. But that was, that was his dividing line for him. Yeah, and I, I think we would really agree with those who would say uh, that we shouldn't divide over something of that nature and that we should be looking for the way uh, to stand together around the truth of God's Word. So when you think of connectivity uh, with leaders and spiritual leaders, Doctrine is what really begins it all. Uh, and that's why I've always said with our church and with our college, let's just go ahead and put up on the flagpole what we believe. Let's not be ashamed of that. It's going to draw people in. And, and sometimes what attracts also repels. And this is what I think some leaders miss is that um, if you are very nondescript about what you believe and where you're headed as a church, uh, you can attract some folks that uh, have no intention of, of following doctrinally uh, where your church is headed. I think you said that well. The truth is like a magnet. It attracts those we can help and repels those we cannot. Right. If you're right. not willing to be subject to the Scripture, right. then I can't help you because the Bible is our sole rule in matters of faith and practice. And if I can show you something from the Bible and you say, yeah, but I think, mm -hmm. then we're not going to get along very well. The next word that I wanted to, to talk about then was the word love, because I believe that we, first of all, are commanded to love one another. Uh, we're commanded to love the saved and the unsaved. 
And we learn that from our Lord. 1 John 3.11 says, This is the message ye have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We're to love our neighbor as ourself. And I think we oftentimes uh, have a loving spirit that is expressed mostly to the people we're closest with, because that's who we know. But I know that God has given to you, and he's certainly given to me the capacity to love any brother in Christ and to appreciate the good that they're doing. In fact, Philippians 1.18 says, What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and therein do I rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Um, you've had the same opportunities that I've had to be disappointed, sometimes hurt by another leader, and uh, they may have some similar doctrine, uh, but the fact is that uh, either in some of the methodologies they're using or some of the uh, perhaps ways they've handled things that have uh, been disappointing, the fellowship is not as close. That doesn't mean that the love and appreciation is not still there. And talk about that for a minute, just the fact of loving God's people, loving God's men, and then there's within that some circles of some fellowship. How would you define that? Well, I, I love the reference you made to Philippians 1. The Apostle Paul said in about verse 9 there, he said, "...and this I pray that your love would abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all doctrine." Right. So the doctrine, the truth is, number one, the wisdom that is from above is first pure and then peaceful. But love is the greatest of these, the Bible says. And I'm commanded to love the brethren. I'm commanded to love the lost. The Lord loved the world and sent his son to die for them. And so a mean, harsh, judgmental spirit never communicates the heart of God. Right. Well, I really believe that there's a tremendous spirit of love in the, in the church today, uh, as I, the church I'm pastoring, but I, I, I want that to continue to grow. And Absolutely. I think uh, whether it's through soul winning or whether it's through helping, uh, as we did this past week with a food drive or going to the police stations and delivering food or you know helping uh, in the bus ministry with the children that maybe uh, just are from a broken home, uh, we want that to be present in the church, but I want that to be shown to God's men, too. That's always been my heart. Recently, I became aware of a man who'd suffered a sadness. He's different than me on Bible translations and many other issues. I know him. He knows me. And I felt like he handled it very well, and I felt badly that he'd had to experience that hurt. So I texted him, and I said, I appreciate your candor, your compassion. Can't imagine what you're going through. And he texted me back, and he said, he said, Brother Willette, that means the world to me. Mm -hmm. Now, what we miss is that though I probably could not partner with him in most ministry areas, yeah. uh, I use a different Bible than he uses. Right. That's, a, that's right. a big divide. I don't count him as an enemy. Mm -hmm. He's a brother. I'm glad for everybody he wins to Christ. I could have lunch with him and enjoy the fellowship and be glad about what he's doing for the Lord Jesus. Because of our differences in how we do ministry, we don't agree enough to work together in many venues, but he's not my enemy, and I shouldn't act as an enemy, and I shouldn't feel towards him as an enemy. Yeah, and I actually um, feel really uh, burdened when you hear about podcasts or social media that is uh, bringing out uh, and, and literally uh, kind of flame throwing at someone just from the standpoint of maybe they're down and trying to make it worse or rejoicing in their trial. I, I really believe we need to weep with those Absolutely. that weep, rejoice with those that rejoice. And sometimes uh, we may take a stand on a doctrinal position or we may speak out against a sin in our country like abortion or something of this nature, but uh, we're commanded to speak the truth in love. And, um, and I, I really believe that that's a principle that will bring connectivity uh, is that intense loving spirit. I believe that about the local church. I think the unsaved are drawn to that. They see love in the church that they don't experience. And I think uh, pastors need to sense that when they're with God's men, rather than just being sized up, rather than being judged based upon the size of the church or, or whatever. So I really believe that doctrine is the beginning point. And then when I meet someone, uh, I want to have a spirit of love toward them. The, th the third word that I jotted down for our time together today is just the word spirit. Um, and this is, this is where you need that discernment that you mentioned in Philippians, let your love abound more and more with knowledge and judgment. Because the tricky part comes when there's someone that you have a doctrinal alignment with, but their spirit changes. Mm -hmm. Maybe they've been disappointed by a mentor. Maybe they've been hurt by you know, some experience in the pastorate. Uh, maybe they're just having a tough time. Uh, and suddenly, uh, 
this person believes what you believe, you love this person, uh, but their spirit seems to have changed. And oftentimes they'll they'll have some form of an offense and they'll want to bring others into their offense with them. Uh, and and it can be a ditch on either side, what I'm talking about. It can be on the progressive side. It can be on the more fundamental separated side. But uh, the spirit, when that spirit changes, it affects a relationship. And I don't know about you. I mean, the Bible speaks of Daniel. He had, he had an excellent spirit. And I've always been connected to people who had that excellent spirit. And, um, and I want to have the right doctrine and that right spirit. But talk about the importance of having the right spirit and talk about where your journey can take you if you get hooked up with someone who maybe says they believe what you believe, but their spirit isn't right. When I was a boy in college, there was a bunch of battles about separation, ecclesiastical separation. And uh, I don't think the people were wrong on their position, but they were kind of ornery about it. And I remember my dad saying, well, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. I'm just not seeing much of that in that crowd. Good. And they ran off people they could have helped because their position was good, but their disposition was ungodly. Later on, uh, pretty early in our church ministry, we had to end supporting a missionary out of our church because he had changed his doctrinal position. And I called him up and talked to him, and I said, we're going to support you for, I think, six months or a year. I want you to have time to cover this. And he said, would you talk to my pastor? I said, sure. I'd be glad to. And I talked to his pastor, and I'll never forget what he said. He said, Brother Willette, if I had met you when I was still in fundamentalism, I'd probably still be a fundamentalist. And I thought how sad it was that a man had changed all of his position because somebody had been unkind, harsh, and unloving. And I, th I think it is really important that our spirit be right. If you're walking in the spirit, if you're filled with the spirit, you're not going to show that meanness and that cantankerousness and that judgmentalness. And I encountered that as a young man. Uh, there are people whose whole ministry is showing what's wrong with somebody, some right. on the right, some on the left. And there's something wrong with that. If you're spending more time exposing stuff than you are expounding scripture. Yeah. If you're spending more time telling what's wrong with everybody else instead of telling me how to reach the rest of the world, then probably you're not terribly balanced. Yeah, I have I have no respect for those on the on the far right who spend their entire ministry writing about how everybody else is doing what they've never yet even tried to do. Uh, just completely uh, critical and erroneous. And, and the same is true for those who've drifted in their spirit to a, to the left side and they have a bitterness towards you know all of of this other. Um, they oftentimes, in their conversation, uh, broad brush as well. And, and I think you're right in that the spirit really makes a difference. And uh, if the spirit is, is continuously negative, it's not going to edify. And you mentioned the word bitterness. That's very important. The Bible says that bitterness leads to a profane person and a fornicator like Esau. It said, if a root of bitterness springs up, it'll trouble you and thereby many be defiled, lest there be that person like Esau. Bitterness starts in my heart, but it affects other people. And the Bible says where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. So I need to be careful not to let people who have been hurt hurt me. Right. Well, uh, you pastored 43 years. I've, I've pastored now for 35 years. So uh, in our 78 years of experience, uh, you know, we've probably both made our fair share of mistakes where we you know, handled something maybe a little abruptly or where we would have wished we would have been more patient. But I, I know this, you don't stay in the same church a, a great length of time and produce people who love the Lord and are consistently serving the Lord uh, unless you learn how to keep your spirit right. And I really believe that uh, God has blessed that uh, in the men that I've tried to learn from and respect. And I personally have tried to pull away from men that I felt it was just all about uh, putting other men down or all about uh, creating a straw man issue. I want to stand where the Bible wants me to stand, but I want to, I want to do that with the right spirit. The fourth principle today is the principle of gratitude. And I feel that uh, in the last times, the Bible says, men will be unthankful. That's one of the, one of the key indicators. And I, I do see that uh, when, when people can take their bad experience in their conservative church 
and uh, forget anything good. Forget that they got saved there. Forget that they met their spouse at Bible college there. Or forget that they uh, were, you know, given a job. All these different things. And suddenly, it's like that Limburger cheese under the nose, you know. Uh, and there's no gratitude. And I know for me, and I've had disappointments with mentors, as you well know, and you've walked me through some of that. Uh, but I know that in my life, uh, keeping a gratitude attitude has helped me uh, to remain closer to the Lord and to avoid bitterness because there's so much to be thankful for. And uh, I've also learned to be grateful for leaders that maybe aren't my closest mentors, maybe I've never preached for them, but just men that have had a distant influence on my life. For example, uh, I'm grateful for the work of the Reformers, though, uh, and, and sometimes I'll quote a Reformer and some angry Calvinist will write me a note and say, don't you know he's a Calvinist? And I'm like, yeah, I think I know that. I've been to his house, his college, the church he pastored. I've read several of his books, but I can still be thankful that he was willing to die at the stake for Jesus Christ, you know? And I think uh, we... Uh, probably as maybe a little bit older in our ministries now, uh, need to do maybe even a better job of letting men know, listen, we're grateful for the good work that's being done. Whether we can endorse every aspect of it or not is another point. For example, uh, John MacArthur won a legal case today for uh, his uh, keeping his church doors open just a few miles from here, really about 60 miles from here. And uh, he was a great encouragement to me during COVID. He really was. We spoke often. Uh, many times the county would come in and write us a ticket, and they would say, uh, we were told to go to Grace Community Church and Lancaster Baptist Church and give you guys a ticket. I'm like, oh, great. And, um, but uh, he won his court case and got a $400,000 settlement today. But I texted him, and I, I, I thanked him sincerely. I mean, he stood up like a lion. He didn't cry all the time and you know, make a big show of it. He just kept preaching. Uh, in doing that, he took some heat off some of the rest of us, you know. And uh, I do think there's a place in the broader spectrum of things if there's a man fighting for the pro-life or fighting for religious liberty or standing for the biblical family that we can be grateful now as well as historically. Uh, so talk a little bit about some of the realms of gratitude in your life and ministry, people that were up close mentors, but maybe some people that, uh, again, influenced you from afar, but you're grateful for what they did. Bob John Sr. said, when gratitude dies on the altar of a man's heart, that man is well nigh hopeless. Right. You cannot be godly and be ungrateful. Good. Neither were they thankful, the Bible right. says, of reprobates. And if I find myself getting upset and irritated about people or situations, it's a reminder to me that I'm not thinking about God enough. That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee mm -hmm. because he trusteth in thee. I travel and I'll have some issues in traveling. I was delayed several hours coming out here. And I'll say to myself, well, I bet you the Apostle Paul never had to sit in the middle seat in the back of an airplane. And it straightens my mind out. And I, I think what you say about people is right as well. Almost nobody is without some value. Uh, uh, Jacob was my least favorite Bible character. I don't like him at all. But God loved him. And God called him a prince. And God used him. And he did great things for the cause of Christ. And it's my job to appreciate what's good about someone without imitating what's bad about them. Right. Well, and I've had men that, that actually did disappoint me in the ministry. Some of them fell out of the ministry. But I can still look back and say, well, you know, I, I learned this from him. Yes. There's, some, there's some men that their doctrine is straight as an arrow. Uh, they uh, just kind of have a different way about how they do their ministry, and they're pretty hard to get along with. Uh, but I can look back and say, well, back at such and so time, he gave me a book, or he invested in this way. And I don't, I don't need to waste my spirit uh, with getting upset or being ungrateful for the good that someone invested in me. I was with a preacher a week ago, and he worked for a man that you'd know that's former military, he's in heaven now, was super harsh and super strong. And I said, tell me something I wouldn't know about that man. He said he was so kind to me and my family. Mm. 
He said, that man never took an appointment before 11, but he told his secretary, if, if Mrs. So-and-so, she had some physical issues and some needs, said, if she ever wants to see me, you let her in no matter what time it was. And I was glad to hear that about that man. Mm -hmm. I was glad to see that there was another side to him. Right. There's a man that's been in heaven a few years, and he was known for being harsh and, and uh, calling people names. But I had a follower of his say, you know, three weeks before he died, he was out on the street weeping and trying to win people to Christ. Hmm. So I don't want to imitate his language, but I can appreciate his zeal for souls. Yeah, I just think there's a lot of ways that we can learn with, without endorsing, you know, necessarily, but, but keep a grateful spirit. And, uh, and that really leads me to the, the fifth word, and that is grace. No relationship is sustained without grace and without a graciousness towards one another. And uh, I think... Uh, that's something that leaders, if they're going to have connect points, are going to have to be more gracious toward one another. I think about men of the past who got along well and they were not exactly the same, uh, whether that's Dr. Malone and you know Dr. Hudson or you know even John R. Rice and some of the others that had camaraderie, but they, if you study it, and the young guys that bring it up and say, look at this, look at this, they're right, they didn't agree, but they graciously worked where they could and when they could together. And you know, we're living in a day where I hear guys, it almost sounds like they're looking for reasons not to connect, right? Preaching against, you know, using an iPad in the pulpit or having a beard or, you know, having church on a Thursday or this and that. And what comes across as a lack of graciousness or not wanting to give liberty. And, you know, we all quote, uh, use not your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. And I really believe, Brother Willette, that, yeah, the flesh might be you know, watching a bad movie or you know saying gossip or whatever the flesh could also be just a pharisaical mean attitude towards another brother and and you know my heart with our striving together conferences has been that it doesn't really matter where someone went to college or you know what their alma mater is or their fellowship is if we have the right doctrine if we have a love for God for one another if we have a right spirit uh, you know let's come together for the purpose of you know edifying one another and and growing together in the grace of God. And I think that's what many times uh, has uh, drawn people to the Striving Together conferences and, yes. and uh, that combination. Well, these things go in cycles. I'm, I'll be 69 later this month if I live till the 27th. I've been saved 65 years. And every once in a while, somebody comes and they try to cut off everybody who's not just like them. And they find reasons to get after people. I could give you three or four different movements that have done that. It always ends up badly. Yeah. And grace is more than just not giving favor to people who don't deserve it. It's giving favor where there is not only no merit, but there is demerit. Right. When the Lord Jesus died on the cross, he died for his enemies. Mm -hmm. And he said, Father, forgive them. So if I want any grace from God, I better show some grace to others. You know, uh, periodically I'll see somebody snip at you and you know, maybe say something on you know, social media or something. And first of all, I, I, I've never felt it's right for a younger man to take someone who's been saved 65 years and you know, do that. But the re the other thing, you know, I'm such a phone calling guy or a face to face guy. I, I, I have little time to really respect somebody that just wants to argue on the internet like that. But what I remember about you when I first met you was that I didn't have some of the same convictions. And even now we'd be slightly different on some things, but that's never mattered in our friendship. You were always gracious to me. I've tried to always be gracious to you. And the few things that might be done a little bit differently, you don't believe deacons were in Acts chapter 6, I do, you know. You learn stuff about music at Bob Jones. I've still never figured some of it out myself, you know. But, you know, we, we understood that doctrinally we were aligned and we wanted to win souls and we knew we were conservative and separated in these areas. And, and so God used that in my life. And I, I want to say to some of the guys that are watching the podcast today, don't assume somebody that's a little more conservative or maybe, you know, says something that's, you know, kind of feels convicting or sharp. Don't assume that person to be uh, ungracious. Maybe give them the chance by even giving them a call. 
I don't know why people can't do that and just call. And sometimes they do. Could you explain this to me, what you wrote in this book or what you said on the, the podcast? I love it when they do that, you know. And I think that should be uh, some the behavior that is really seen more if there's going to be a maintained connectivity. Well, we expect everybody to believe what we believe at the moment we believe it or we think they're wrong. Right. John Rice had a meeting in Miami, Florida with Wayne Van Gelderen Sr. in the 50s. Wayne Van Gelderen had just come out of the Southern Baptist Convention and was all upset at the people who stayed in. And he talked to Dr. Rice about it. And Dr. Rice had been out of the convention for years, took a strong stand against mm -hmm. it. And he said, son, are they wicked? Wayne Van Gelderen thought of it and he said, yeah, they're wicked. He said, are they all wicked? He thought again, he said, yeah, they're all wicked. And then he said, son, how long have you been out? Well, he said, I've been out six months. And his final statement was, were you wicked six months ago? That's, that's something to think about. Well, I'll tell you, um, every one of us are growing in grace and need God's grace. And I just, I feel like there are times when you can reach out to a pastor uh, who maybe you glance and say, I'm not sure where he's going or why he did that, and, and your reaching out was a salvaging point for him and having, having that heart toward him. And uh, it's been my desire to, to live with, you know, keeping short accounts with God, to live peaceably with all men as much as possible. And uh, I just can't carry the baggage um, around. I want to I wanna have a spirit. And if, if, if someone doesn't want a fellowship per se or, or feels like they can't, that's, that's fine. But uh, I, I want to find uh, avenues to further God's work, whether it's missions, church planning. I don't find those avenues through uh, one group or one fellowship. I, I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful, frankly, God works outside of the Independent Baptist Movement to save souls, sure. you know, and I, I'm grateful for that. But as far as working with people that have like doctrine, uh, as we do from the standpoint of supporting and financially and missions, um, we, we want to be encouraging those that are heading in that direction. Well, some people, if they see a guy leaning out of the boat, they try to push him in the lake. Right. Other people try to pull him back in right. and try to help them and encourage them. As years ago, I would say to my friends who are older, don't fuss at your young friends if they grow a goatee. Mm -hmm. You know, we were against it because socially it was a negative in the hippie movement. Biblically, it was never wrong. Right. And we shouldn't make an issue about that. If my young friend stands up with a goatee and no tie and preaches from his King James Bible and gets people saved, I'm going to say praise God. Right. And I, I do believe that there are men today who have a kind of that rough and ready progressive attitude and kind of an in your face and everybody that I ever knew before was wrong. And it just it shows and you can see it sometimes in things they write or things they say. And that goes back to the spirit. But then there's other people who, uh, like you said, they may not wear a tie or something. They may do some things differently. But they're very grateful for what they've received. And they're, they're wanting to stay involved and stay connected in fellowship. And, and so thank the Lord for that. And give grace to both. Give grace to the guy that's kind of on a banny rooster issue. Uh, but, but really, uh, don't be looking to cut people off who are slightly different. No, we need to be grateful for the young men that are taking a good stand, even though they do some things differently than we do them. There's no question. I think that's been something that, for me, has been something, somewhat of a journey to really get to seeing that because uh, I know that you know you do certain things a certain way, you model certain things, you kind of expect that others are going to do some of that, and many do. You know, there's a lot that do. For example, graduates of our college do it about exactly how we taught them. There's a lot that don't. That doesn't speak to their heart necessarily. Um, there, I can't judge their heart. I do know uh, that God's using different men in different areas, and I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful that souls are being saved. I also know I'm comfortable with the way I do things here and intend to maintain the direction that God's given to me. And so uh, these, these connection points, I think, are important, and these conversations are important because Satan's trying to divide and, uh, and oftentimes draw men away uh, from either truth or from relationships that are needful in their life. I've seen fathers and sons, preachers and their own sons, who don't even fellowship, and it's, it's really sad. It's really, it speaks to a spiritual breakdown somewhere. And uh, I just want to encourage all of you with today's podcast to, to look for the connectivity that the Lord will give and then to maintain those strong doctrinal connections and uh, the fellowship that is around right doctrine and practice 
but also with others that are doing the work of the Lord to maintain a heart of love, to maintain a right spirit, and to maintain grace within your heart. And I know, Dr. Ouellette, over like two, about two years ago, I was uh, delineating some issues with respect to uh, the critical race theory and, and the hyper grace movement and some false interpretations uh, that I saw scripturally some, some men heading into. Uh, that Even that was done with the spirit to salvage yes. and to help. Uh, I also know that your ministry can't be always warning. You know, the Bible says reprove, rebuke, and exhort. And that, I'm excited about leadership conference this year because it's going to be really the most positive thing you could ever do, focusing on the death, burial, and resurrection of the gospel and how to get it out to the community. The most helpful conference any preacher could attend in the United States is your leadership conference. The right spirit, lots of how to do it, encouraging, inspiring, preaching, great music, and being around so many people that have the same heart and seeing that God is still at work, I would encourage everybody to come. Well, we're praying for a great time, and really with this theme of connectivity, if some of these thoughts have resonated with you, having uh, a doctrinal connection, being with men who love God and who love one another, being with men who have uh, really a gratitude for the past and what we've learned, and the present, and even for the men that are going to lead the future, uh, if you're looking to be involved in something that is endeavoring to have a right spirit, uh, along the way with a gracious heart towards one another. I invite you to Spiritual Leadership Conference. You'll find the doctrine to be strong. You'll find the spirit to be sweet. And you'll find some connection points and some people with whom to connect. And we're not trying to start a fellowship, a denomination, or anything of that nature. But as iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friends. And I hope some of these thoughts today on connectivity uh, spurred some thoughts in your own heart and that God will give you those kinds of relationships that we've enjoyed now uh, for several decades. And uh, it's something that is a treasure from the Lord. And I look forward to our time together on next month's podcast. Until then, don't forget October 3rd through 6th, Spiritual Leadership Conference. We have many gifts for you that, that attend. We have the 35th anniversary album of Lancaster Baptist Church. We have the Revised Constitution which we just drew up a few months ago that deals with the gender issues that we're facing. Uh, that's going to be given as a free gift. We have all the materials that we've used in printed form over the last year. Lots of new books and materials. I think the best selling is going to be my wife Terry's new book, her, her hospitality book with 50 recipes and pictures of the food. I get hungry every time I look at that book, and every pastor is going to want to get a copy for uh, their spouse, their their wife. And a new devotional just came in today entitled The Gospel in You, a 90-day devotional. This is going to be great for teens, college students, new Christians, a Bible reading schedule, a devotional, and then an application portion. Lots of resources, lots of new curriculums available. I think there's 13 new, brand new books and curriculums that are available 30 days from now. And so join us, pray with us, and until then, may God richly bless you.